Welcome to Claire's Classes Listening Challenge. This is the IELTS Listening Test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between a woman making inquiries and a school receptionist. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good afternoon, Estelle speaking. What can I do for you? I was told that the school holds, um, adult education classes. Yes, it does. We run seven a week, three on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and one on Wednesdays. Are they all evening classes? No. Because of the number of people who work shifts these days, we've found there's quite a demand for day classes as well. Well, I don't work, and I really want to get out and meet people, so daytime or evening would suit me. What is it you're particularly interested in? Oh, anything really. Okay. On Tuesdays, we have a writing workshop for those people who've always longed to write but are hesitant about putting pen to paper. Hmm. It's an evening class and runs from 6 to 7.30, but there is a restriction on numbers. Oh. Yes. The tutor has advised us to restrict participants to a maximum of 10 per session, so I'll have to check and let you know if there is room for you. Thank you. Also, on Tuesdays, there is a book club designed for older adults looking to be inspired, to learn and share insights with one another. Are there any restrictions on that? Not really, but you'd have to be able to read the prescribed book each week. Hmm. You have to read set books, do you? Yes, and keep up with the others by finishing one a week. I understand. What else do you have? There's a history group on Tuesdays as well, run by a researcher and historian who provides a fascinating glimpse for you into the lives and society around this area a hundred years ago. Hmm, I don't think so. Well, what about Scrabble Club on Wednesday? It's extremely popular, you know. Sounds good. What time? 2 to 3.30 in the afternoon. Yes, I think I could manage that. Well, if you like Scrabble, you might like to join the Chess Night on Thursday evenings. It's more for serious players, though. Unfortunately, I don't play chess. Would you be interested in cake decorating? Well, I do enjoy baking from time to time. Have you thought about decorated cakes, though? You know, they make a wonderful focal point of any special celebration. Maybe not. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Look, I don't know if you'd be interested, but next month there's going to be an Adult Learners Week, and it's a great opportunity to learn something new and meet a lot of people. All the events are free, but booking is essential. What are the events? I'll give you a brief rundown, and if you decide there's something in it for you, I can send you all the details. Great! When is it? The first week in September, from the 1st to the 8th. Oh, 
Are they all daytime events? Yes, but some are half day and some are whole day sessions. Can you just quickly tell me about the half day ones, please? Okay. The Techno Expo will help you work with social networking tools, and you can learn more about online privacy and security and online entertainment. That's Monday the 1st. In the morning? Actually, it's after lunch, from 1 to 4 30. What else is there in the afternoon? Well, on Wednesday, there's work life balance. Understanding how to assess what you really value, the importance of balance and harmony in your life, and how to achieve it. That's another one I'd like to go to. Are there any more? No, no more half days in the afternoon. Wait a minute. There is a poetry event. What does that entail? Writing some inspirational poems and sharing them with the class. No, thank you. I'm not going to read my poems to other people. I know what you mean. One more thing. Can you tell me where all the events are being held? Yes, all the workshops are at the Central Library. Oh, good. That's handy. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 2. You will hear the manager of a childcare service at a primary school talking to parents at an open day about the school's childcare service offered before and after school. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good afternoon. My name's Mrs. Carter, and I run the before and after school extended hours childcare service. I hope you've had a chance to have a good look around the school and talk to staff and pupils. I know that many of you are interested in using our childcare service when your child joins the school. And perhaps you already know something about it. But for those that don't, I'll go through the main details now. We offer childcare for children from the ages of 4 to 11, both before and after school. I know that many parents who work find this service invaluable. You can leave your child with us safe in the knowledge that they will be extremely well cared for. We are insured to provide care for up to 70 children, although we rarely have this many attending at any one session. I think we generally expect around 50 to 60 children for the afternoon sessions, and about half that number for the breakfast sessions. Although we currently do have 70 children registered with us, not all of these attend every day. It's 10 years since we began offering an extended hours service, and we've come a long way during that time. When we first opened, we only had about 20 children attending regularly. We try to keep our costs as low as we can, and we think we provide very good value for money. For the afternoon sessions, which run from 3 30 until 6 pm, it's £7.20. But if you prefer, You can pay for one hour only, which costs £3.50, or two hours, which costs £5.70. The cost of the childcare includes food and snacks. They'll be given breakfast in the morning and in the afternoon, a healthy snack as soon as they finish school. At 5 pm, children are given something more substantial, such as pasta or a casserole. 
Please inform us of any allergies that your child might have, and we'll make sure they're offered a suitable alternative. As you may know, the child care service runs through the school holidays from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. We offer a really varied and exciting program to keep the children entertained. We don't want them to feel as if they are still at school. It will also feel different because they'll get the chance to make new friends with children from other schools. Spaces are available for them because a lot of our term time children don't always attend during the holiday. In the past, parents have asked if children over the age of eleven are allowed to come with their younger brothers and sisters, but I'm afraid we're unable to do this because of the type of insurance we have. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. So now let me tell you about some of the activities that your child can do during the after-school sessions, as well as being able to use the playground equipment, computers, and the library. There is usually at least one special activity that children can do each day. For example, Spanish. We have a specialist teacher coming in every Thursday to give a basic introduction to the language through games and songs. She does two sessions: one for the over eights and one for the younger children. This is the only activity which we have to make an extra charge for, but it's well worth it. Once a week, the children have the opportunity to do some music. We're very lucky that one of our staff is a member of a folk band. On Mondays, she teaches singing and percussion to groups of children. We do rely on parental support for this, so if any of you sing or play an instrument and would be prepared to help out at these sessions, we'd be delighted. Painting continues to be one of the most popular activities. To begin with, we weren't keen on offering this because of the extra mess involved, but children kept asking if they could do some art. And so we finally gave in. Art is great for helping the children to relax after working hard at school all day. Yoga is something that we've been meaning to introduce for some time, but haven't been able to find anyone available to teach it until now. That is, so we'll see how this goes. Hopefully, children will benefit in all sorts of ways from this. Cooking is another popular activity. They make a different sort of cake or pizza or bread each week. Although the younger children love doing it, we found that the mess was just too much. So we've decided to restrict this to the over eights, as they are better able to clean up after themselves. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part three. Following instructions from their tutor, you will hear two trainee teachers discussing the use of origami, a paper folding activity, in the classroom. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-seven.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. So now I want you to discuss the lesson we've just been watching on the video and think about the ways in which origami can be a useful educational tool. Can you all work with the person sitting next to you? I had no idea that such a simple thing like folding squares of paper to make the shape of something like a bird could be such an amazing tool. It's made me see origami in a whole new light. I know. It was interesting to see the educational skills the children were developing by doing origami. On the video you could see them really listening hard to make sure they did all the steps in the right order to make the bird. That's right. In this lesson they were working individually, but it would also be interesting to see if the children could work out how to make something simple without being given any direction. That would help with building teamwork as well. Yes, but much more of a challenge. One thing that really stood out for me was that the children were all having fun while being taught something new. Which is a key aim of any lesson with this age group. And although these kids had no problems with folding the paper, with younger children you could do origami to help practice fine motor skills. Absolutely. Shall we talk about the individual children we saw on the video? I wrote all their names down and took some notes. Yes, I did too. OK, good. Let's start with Sid. He was interesting because before they started doing the origami, he was being quite disruptive. Yes, he really benefited from having to use his hands. It helped him to settle down and start concentrating. Yes, I noticed that too. What about Jack? I noticed he seemed to want to work things out for himself. Mm. You could see him trying out different things rather than asking the teacher for help. What did you make of Naomi? She seemed to be losing interest at one point, but then she decided she wanted her mouse to be the best, and that motivated her to try harder. She didn't seem satisfied with hers in the end, though. No. Anya was such a star. She listened so carefully and then produced the perfect bird with very little effort. Hmm, I think the teacher could have increased the level of difficulty for her. Maybe. I think it was the first time Zara had come across origami. She looked as if she didn't really get what was going on. She seemed unsure about what she was supposed to do, but in the end hers didn't turn out too badly. Yeah, I'm sure it was a positive learning experience for her. Hmm. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. I think one reason why the origami activity worked so well in this class was that the teacher was well prepared. Right. I think it would have taken me ages to prepare examples showing each of the steps involved in making the bird. But that was a really good idea. The children could see what they were aiming for and much better for them to be able to hold something rather than just looking at pictures. Mm, those physical examples supported her verbal explanations really well. It's strange that origami isn't used more widely. Why do you think that is? Well, teachers may just feel it's not that appealing to children who are used to doing everything on computers, especially boys even if they're aware of the benefits. Oh, I don't know. It's no different to any other craft activity. I bet it's because so many teachers are clumsy like me. <laughs> That's true. Too much effort required if you're not good with your hands. Well, anyway, I think we should try it out in our maths teaching practice with Year 3. I can see using origami is a really engaging way of reinforcing children's knowledge of geometric shapes, like they were doing in the video. 
But I think it would also work really well for presenting fractions, which is coming up soon. Good idea. That's something most of the kids in that class might struggle with. Origami would also be good practice for using symmetry, but I think they did that last term. Okay. Well, let's try and get some ideas together and plan the lesson next week. Okay. If you could all. That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part three. Part four. You will hear a lecturer on a languages course talking about the impact of digital technology on Icelandic, the native language of Iceland. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Right, everyone. Let's make a start. Over the past few sessions, we've been considering the reasons why some world languages are in decline, and today I'm going to introduce another factor that affects languages and the speakers of those languages, and that's technology, and in particular, digital technology. In order to illustrate its effect, I'm going to focus on the Icelandic language, which is spoken by around 321,000 people, most of whom live in Iceland, an island in the North Atlantic Ocean. The problem for this language is not the number of speakers, even though this number is small, nor is it about losing words to other languages such as English. In fact, the vocabulary of Icelandic. Is continually increasing, because when speakers need a new word for something, they tend to create one rather than borrowing from another language. All this makes Icelandic quite a special language. It's changed very little in the past millennium, yet it can handle twenty-first-century concepts related to the use of computers and digital technology. Take, for example, the word for web browser. This is vafri. In Icelandic, which comes from the verb to wander, I can't think of a more appropriate term because that's exactly what you do mentally when you browse the internet. Then there's an Icelandic word for podcast, which is too hard to pronounce, and so on. Icelandic then is alive and growing, but, and it's a big but. Young Icelanders spend a great deal of time in the digital world, and this world is predominantly English. Think about smartphones. They didn't even exist until comparatively recently, but today young people use them all the time to read books, watch TV or films, play games, listen to music, and so on. Obviously, this is a good thing in many respects because it promotes their bilingual skills. But the extent of the influence of English in the virtual world is staggering, and it's all happening really fast. For their parents and grandparents. The change is less concerning because they already have their native speaker skills in Icelandic, but for young speakers, well, the outcome is a little troubling. For example, teachers have found that playground conversations in Icelandic secondary schools can be conducted entirely in English, while teachers of much younger children have reported situations 
where their classes find it easier to say what is in a picture using English rather than Icelandic. The very real and worrying consequence of all this is that the young generation in Iceland is at risk of losing its mother tongue. Of course, this is happening to other European languages too. But while internet companies might be willing to offer, say, French options in their systems, it's much harder for them to justify the expense of doing the same for a language that has a population the size of a French town, such as Nice. The other drawback of Icelandic is the grammar, which is significantly more complex than in most languages. At the moment, the tech giants are simply not interested in tackling this. So, what is the Icelandic government doing about this? Well, large sums of money are being allocated to a language technology fund that it is hoped will lead to the development of Icelandic sourced apps and other social media and digital systems. But clearly this is going to be an uphill struggle. On the positive side, they know that Icelandic is still the official language of education and government. It has survived for well over a thousand years, and the experts predict that its future in this nation-state is sound and will continue to be so. However, there's no doubt that it's becoming an inevitable second choice in young people's lives. This raises important questions. When you consider how much of the past is tied up in a language, will young Icelanders lose their sense of their own identity? Another issue that concerns the government of Iceland is this. If children are learning two languages through different routes, neither of which they are fully fluent in, will they be able to express themselves properly? That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.
That is the end of the listening test.